The brothers wish. The brothers wish, brothers wish. The brothers wish. The brothers. You're now listening to Greg, it's the brothers. Hey everybody, Let's this take a is ride Greg with another Titch video. Bye. Finally, we've got <laughs> Nick Braulio. I, I said that right, right? Yeah, that's right. Excellent, that's excellent. Correct. So Nick... Let's jump into it, brother. How long have you been in the industry? Um, about, let's see, this will be 22 years. 22 years. And it started around 97, so just what, sort of by chance. What would you categorize yourself as? Are you, are you more a network guy, more a server guy? Are you just kind of an everything guy? Well, I mean, I've done a little bit of everything in that amount of time, mostly because like in the 90s, you kind of had to. Um, <laughs> But I would say if you put me in a corner and ask me what my core competency is, I'd probably say service provider networking. Service provider networking. Yeah. Excellent. And that's probably 99% of people that listen to this are, are, are going to be somewhere in that boat, I would think, right? Yeah. I mean, not WISP specifically, although I have done some of that. Um, just service provider work or large campus type uh, environments. That's the stuff I like. I like the stuff that's actually cabled uh, and physically connected. <laughs> that wireless stuff, that's all magic. It's all smoke and mirrors. It's all voodoo. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I like the RF stuff, and that's <laughs> one of the reasons. Actually, it, it, it speaks to the first bullet in my list. Um, it's something that I find very fascinating, but I am very much not an expert in it, so I'm sort of gravitated towards that as a, the thing I want to learn more about over the last few years. Well, I, for me, it's always seemed, it's like, how do you, if you're going to explain what wireless networking is like, you know, like in the fixed-based wireless world to uh, muggles, you know, to normal humans out in the world, <laughs> it's like, muggles. I mean, it's, I mean, if you think about it, it's, it's like this living, breathing thing that's truly alive. So it's never set it and forget it. There's nothing set it and forget it in wireless networking, right? Where it's like in... Yeah. The physical world, if I plug an optic in, it's probably going to work for several years and I'll never have to even think about it again. So yep. it's such a shift. I was going to say it's such a mind uh, F. I know, uh, yep, I know where you're going with yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, 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 it's just it's so very different. But yeah, you're, as you're alluding to, uh, your first tip says be the dumbest person in the room, which is never a problem for me. It's so yeah, easy. Yeah, me either. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that one comes naturally. But I think that that's a, it's an important thing because in technology, you know, the type of personalities that are, are typically drawn to a highly technical job aren't necessarily the ones that are going to go out and seek being incorrect about things. Yeah. Right. And, and that's sort of what being the dumbest person in the room is all about. Like if I'm the smartest guy in the room, I'm in the wrong room. I'm never going to learn anything in there. Right. Wow. And, I'm, and, I, and I'm probably going to have people that are just asking me questions that I then answer. And whether I'm right or wrong doesn't matter because I'm foreseen as the smartest person in the room. By the way, this never happens to me. But, you know, I will purposely go out and try to find places where my comfort level is basically zero. That way I can learn from somebody who is comfortable there and and then grow my, you know, my sphere of knowledge based on that. Like I never want to be right all the time. I want to be wrong. I want to have somebody questioning me and being the, you know, perceived smartest person in the room is not the way that you do that. That's such a pragmatic approach to i guess it in general right i mean it does i i feel like a lot of guys in it we want to feel important right and, and one of the ways we sort of validate ourselves are by being the expert so it's just it's so against our nature to not be the expert so i i, I applaud you for that i mean it took me a long time to sort of and i'm not all the way there man <laughs> nobody's ever all the way there i think but but yeah, that's that's such a great mentality to walk into it as if if I am the smartest person in the room, I'm not going to learn anything. I love that. I'd never I've never looked at it through those eyes. That's brilliant. I, I always I'm a I'm a very social person. I am the, like the very atypical technical person, mostly because I kind of fell into technology. Um, like I am very much an extrovert. I am very communicative. I like to interact with people. Being like doing this kind of thing. It's not stressful to me at all. I like to do public speaking. It charges my batteries up. 
So I think I'm, I'm a little bit different in, in that way especially. But I did also have to take a, a fair amount of time to come to that conclusion. Like I was a, a long time ago, almost 20 years ago, I, I was building a broadband service provider and I was the senior guy and I had direct reports and all these things. And I was probably a little too young to be shoved into that situation because I was in my mid-20s. And I just, I got a big, I got a, I got a huge head because like, like I was the guy, right. right? Everyone came to me for all the answers. And um, I was, I'm in a university town, so I had a bunch of university customers. And one of them said, hey, you should apply for this job that we have open here at the supercomputing center. And I was like, eh, maybe. And I thought about it a little bit. And I was like, maybe I should do that, right? I've been here for a while. And, you know, we were not, we weren't the ILEC. So, like, the amount of time we were going to be profitable was dropping very quickly because the ILEC was starting to build out their broadband solution, which is going to be cheaper than ours. And I thought, well, I'll give it a try, right? And I interviewed and they offered me the job and I wasn't there two days before I realized that I was unquestionably the dumbest person in that group. Like, no question about it. So I panicked first off. I was like, what have I done, right? I went from being big fish to basically like a bait at this point. <laughs> and... I, I was talking to my wife about it, and uh, my wife is, you know, orders of magnitude smarter than I am and better at these kind of things, and said, why don't you just try to learn from it? And I was like, man, that's a good idea. <laughs> so all credit to her for that. Yeah. You know, it's – your story rings kind of true with me, too. I – I well, at the I was at a, a job – and I was educating myself, right? So I did computer science in school. I didn't do networking, but I've always been kind of a physical guy. And I love the way networking brings my two loves together, computers and then, you know, using my hands to make things, right? It's sort of, like, you know, the physical manifestation of, of all of that together. And so I started getting certified and, you know, I got my CCNA and then like basically the entire network department quit. So I became the network guy, right? And so I was doing all that stuff and then I ended up, you know, moving to uh, this data center and I was there with a couple of other engineers. Well, one guy was an HP engineer and he had been, I mean, he had been networking for probably as long as you had, you know, it was just brilliant guy. And, you know, I'd always sort of had this chip on my shoulder that, you know, before I was the guy and now I want to be the guy. And, and I squandered so many opportunities to learn from this guy. And, uh, you know, he's still very patient and very receptive to questions and things like that. Even now, um, now that we don't work together, you know, I'm perfectly happy with asking him questions in my, my brain. Now, the new person I am, you know, that, I, that I wasn't then, you know, I, I have no problems asking questions and I, I can't help but look back and think what huge pieces of wisdom or knowledge did I miss out on just because, you know, I was too busy trying to be that, that bigger fish, you know, that, that I just, yep. I couldn't ask for help. Oh, golly. Well, that cuts to the quick. Yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Just be, be, and not just be the dumbest guy, but be okay being the dumbest guy seems yep. to be, you know what I mean? It's, it's for me, it's super easy to be the dumbest guy in the room, but, but being okay with that and, and embracing that is, is I think very different. And uh, I think that's such a great idea. I mean, I, just I mean, that, that. that's, I like to mentor junior engineers and I've been doing it for 15 years or so. And that's one of the first things that I try to teach because it took me a long time and I, like you, I feel like I wasted a lot of opportunities to learn and better myself because my ego was in the way. Yeah. And, you know, I try to teach these guys like, look, man, you're going to mess stuff up. You're going to make mistakes. You're not going to know all the things. And that's, that's okay. Like ask questions. Being really great at your job doesn't mean that you can regurgitate router configs or, commands from the top of your head it means you know where to find the answers when you don't know them that's right Expeditious. Um, so i always try to teach him that yeah and also when everything goes wrong not losing your mind that's yeah that's and that's something no school to, can teach you you know it's nope it doesn't matter how much college you get how much anything you have to that's what i tell people I, you know in like high pressure networking jobs if you're going to be on my team you need to be there and it's going to break and you're going to fold like a lawn chair and that's okay. Right. It, it, everybody does the first time they all break down, but it's, oh, yeah. can you learn to be resolute, you know, in, 
in all this onslaught, you know, what is it? There's like, uh, I think I saw a cartoon where it's like, uh, it had a junior admin and a senior admin and they were in a bar and it was on fire. And the senior admin was just sitting there doing shots while the junior guy was running around freaking out, you know, and I guess, I guess that's kind of, that's kind of what it's like in our world, right? It's like, you yeah. have to learn to, to get there at some point. Yep. That's a hard one to learn too. It's right. It's definitely, it, it's, you got to get just that thousand in, yard stare, right? You have to, you uh -huh. have to be there in battle and get used it, to it. It takes getting set on fire a couple of times before you realize like, I'm, you know, I'm not going to die. Yeah. Yeah. They're not going to come to my okay. house and kill my dog. You know, yep. everything's going to be fine. <laughs> it's, it's not going to be a John Wick situation here. <laughs> yeah. Just don't kill his dog. I think that's, right. that's, that's the lesson I learned from that movie. It's uh, yes. animal cruelty is uh, far more dangerous than you thought it was. So just be very <laughs> careful with that. Indeed. All right. So your number two, you have know your network. What do you mean by uh, that? Oh God, I can't say this enough time. So I'm very passionate about network monitoring and network analytics and I think that it's one of the most unsung and underrated things for running a network of any size. Because because if you don't know what your network is doing, then you don't know when it's broken or when it's working well. So having good baselines, knowing you know where to look for the trends, is immeasurably valuable. Like if if I don't know that my CPU on my router runs at 10% all the time, when I see a CPU spike, I don't know if that's normal or not. Right? Same goes for like the number of routes I've received or the traffic that I have on an egress interface or the load on a server. You just need to know what the what the network is doing. And there's so many ways to do this and there's so many ways to get overwhelmed by the amount of data that you can get you know, flow data and SNMP and syslogs and all these things. In my opinion, you want to have all of them. You don't have to look at them every day, right? But you want to have probably a year's worth of trend data for that kind of stuff so that you know what your baselines are. Right. Baselining your network is huge. So what does it look like when things are going right? right? Exactly. This is what you it don't looks know. like normally. So I can compare it to, oh, no, things are wrong. Let's figure out what's happening. Look for yep. the anomalies, right? Yeah, and a, a big part of that is, you know, I have a caveman brain. Like, I don't know something's different until I can see, you know, I'm a visual guy. Oh, so, yeah. like, oh, there's a spike that I haven't seen before. And and knowing your network is one of the smartest things you can do. Um, learning what your network is doing all the time, what's normal, is one of the smartest things you can do uh, as a network engineer, regardless of how long you've been doing it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And... um. I think too, I mean, cause you've done consulting too, right? Um, whenever you're called in, that's one of the first things we need to know is what is your, I mean, what is your normal? What do you look like now? You know, how does your, I mean, how is your, and obviously documentation too, but how is, how are things laid out? You know? So if I don't know what's normal and you don't know what's normal, I mean, that's pretty bad. You know, <laughs> it's, yeah. how are we going to, how are we going to go from here to somewhere else? Um, yeah. I mean, it's been a little while since I've done any stuff like that, but like, Eight out of ten times, there's no documentation, and probably seven out of ten times, the monitoring is either limited or um, isn't isn't there. So you have to figure out, you know, what's going on because you know a lot of, a lot of the times, and again, and it's been a little while for me. You know, you get called for something, and they just know it's broken, and they don't know what the normal actually is, and that's why someone is calling you um so i'm very i'm very passionate about having analytics so when you for, talk to people and they say you know what i don't i mean i don't really have adequate monitoring i don't really know what things look like what do you think are the most common reasons people say that i mean why do you think people lack um you know a, a, a nice complete network system monitoring system? well be because and i've been guilty of this myself and i'm pretty sure we all have a, a running network is a job completed, right? So if you have, a, so let's say, a WISP, right? You've got, you've got customers that are connected. Their IPs are getting from point A to point B, and the phone is not ringing, then, you, you know, that's considered successful, right? And in a way, it is, right? Yeah. You know, the service is provisioned, and the customers are happy, and they're paying their bill, if you're lucky. And... Well, I mean, everybody has yeah. customers that don't. Yeah, of course. 
but you know so a lot of times it, you know, especially in small operations, it's very much keep the wheels on the bus, right? You can run the network without having that data. Clearly, people do it every day, right? And they do it for long periods of time. But, you know, having been a Boy Scout, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. So I always encourage, you know, set up LibreNMS or the Dude or you know, something, solar winds, it, whatever whatever works for your workflow, right? And, and and at least start graphing interfaces and oh my God, please start collecting configurations so you can see differences in your configs at least daily. That's one of the most under undervalued pieces of uh, network information is who changed something on the router? Like what changed? Yeah. And that's and and I've heard some people say, you know, well I don't really uh, you know, I don't want to name names. I don't want to blame people. And it's, and, it, and that's not what it's about. It's not about saying, hey, John was over there in the router. He jacked it up. He's the one who made the change. That's not about it. You know, it's about seeing what changed, rectifying, you know, or even um, con uh, consolidation of configuration changes, right? So, you know, or um, making sure that we're the same across the board. Do all of our routers use the same DNS servers? Are they all using the same NTP servers? You know, what do the firewall yep. rules look like on these things? You know, if you're collecting all that information, you can so much uh, more efficiently manage those things. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's another piece. So that, that really plays well into the next part. But I, I want to say, you know, it's never about the blame game, yeah. right? It doesn't matter. Like, mm -hmm. blame solves no problems, what I tell my kids all the time. Blame solves no problems. It really only causes them. So having that information and just knowing what changed will teach you something. And like my next bullet point, failure is your friend, right? When you break something, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because if you learn from it, then it's a good thing. And you're never going to learn anything if everything goes right all the time. <laughs> yeah, I've never had that problem. <laughs> right. You know, I used to tell my guys when I, when I had a team, you know, I said, it's okay. You're going to break stuff. And if you're not, if you're not, I didn't. I, phrased it a little more colorfully than this, but I said, if you're not breaking something or screwing something up every so often, you probably aren't pushing yourself hard enough, right? Get out of your comfort zone every so often. No one's going to come and hit you with reads when you break something. We might say, okay, don't do that again, and let's figure out what was and why it happened, but no one's, you're not going to get your hand slapped, right? And if you're in an environment where that happens, probably try to find a new environment, you know? Negative reinforcement is very rarely uh, no. effective short-term short-term gains on that it doesn't last yeah so yeah and it just yeah it creates an environment nobody wants to be in yeah but i mean failure is is your friend like you're gonna learn so much more from that time that the network core melted down than you are from that time when you left early because everything was working right yeah. You know, you might learn that there's a, you know, there's a happy hour special, <laughs> which is a good thing, but. Well, I mean, the most, I guess the most prominent parts of at least my personality were born from adversity, you know, so a lot of my traits, I can trace back to generally really jacked up stuff that's happened to me in the past, um, you know, so, you know, I definitely learn uh, quicker and more long lasting from burning my hand on the stove than I do, yeah, from, you know leaving early from work one day, except for yeah. that one day that we left to go see a movie and I got in a car accident and I was like, man, that's what uh, I get. That's, that's what I get, man. That sucks. Yeah, that is what it is. But I, I'm all about that. Like fail early, fail often, learn from it, move to the next thing. Yeah, right? for sure. And I think too, failure, especially when you're trying to, to learn something new, that's, that's you figuring out all the various ways that it, it can go right and it can go wrong. Kind of like in Microtech, you can do the same thing probably four different ways and more than likely you should only do it one of those ways, right? Even though it's yep. possible from the others, but so, but that way you can figure out, you know, all the different avenues that you could possibly take. And um, I just, I do, that's, that's how I learn, you know, is, yep, is through trial here. and error generally. I don't want somebody just, to just tell me what the answer is because that's not going to stick. For some reason I need to, you know, I need to bang my head against it for a minute. I'm the same way. And call back to John's podcast, where he said, you know, lab it up, like that can't be stated enough. Like that's, you, you know, fail early, fail often doesn't have to be in the production network. Yeah. And it probably shouldn't be, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> fail early and fail often in your lab. And if you don't have a, a lab environment, I mean, especially if you're using Microtech gear, super easy to set up 
couple CHRs under EVNG or GNS3 or whatever, and yeah. it just works. You don't have to pay for anything. Yeah. And you can, I mean, you can really do some obnoxious stuff in there. Yeah. Well, and it's I mean, even contained. if you wanted to use physical routers, now that you could get the the half lights for $19, I mean, you could spend, oh, yeah, that's true. you could spend a hundred bucks and get five of those things, you know, and you can build yourself an MPLS core in your basement. Ask me how I know that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a rack of kit right there full of Cisco routers and Microtik and just everything. And it's most of it's old crap. I got off of eBay, but still hundred percent functional and, and I can lab virtually anything I can imagine up in there. And I do, I keep it on, yep. um, uh, old, Digi, uh, what digital loggers, remote power things. I had mm -hmm. some uh, that uh, somebody their power supply failed on them, so I got them and just put wall warts into them. Uh, use those, and then you can get um, uh, console servers for sixty bucks on eBay to get to the serial ports. I mean, you can build a lab so cheap. I mean, I know, yeah. you know, if you tell somebody five hundred bucks for a lab, at one point in my life that was an astronomical amount of money. Not so much anymore. Uh, but also, if you're at an employer that's going to incentivize you to do certifications and stuff, I mean, think about it. If that equipment gets you one cert and that gets you, I don't know, four grand more a year, then it's super paid for itself. It's always a good idea to invest in yourself, right? Because that's stuff that people can't take away, right? Yeah. That's what I always tell my kids. Like, you want to learn as much as you can because that can't be, you can't take that away. Yeah. I especially say if your employer lets you learn on their dime, on their time, take it you know that's absolutely that's what i tell my guys is like you're building yourself here that's what you're doing you're building your resume so this free yep. time you have take it use it you know take it from someone who worked at a university for like 13 years and could have finished my master's degree for free and <laughs> oh. didn't <laughs> i don't yeah, know one of my one of my few regrets in those early you years know. you're formidable you're you're still i don't know you're still learning who you are and all that stuff i I don't, I don't fault anybody for um, not necessarily taking advantage of those things. Well, but it's important to know, to see that they exist, yeah, right? Because 100%. if every, you know, if 10 people see that that exists and they didn't before, probably two of them are going to take advantage of it. And that's a win as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. I'm, I'm all about taking advantage of anything that's there. You know, I used to, um, I know this is going to be completely off topic, but of, of like privilege, right? Like, you know, like some of us are, are born into privilege, right? Like, so I know like I'm male, I'm uh, six foot three. So uh, that actually gives me statistically, I'm more likely to be successful because of those two things. And I try and take advantage of them. I don't try and um, put others down because of it, but it's like, I think, you know, if, uh, if you have the gift of gab and you can get in front of people, Go be a goddamn weatherman. You know what I mean? It's like if you've got <laughs> attributes, if you've got advantages surrounding you, take advantage of them. You know, yep. don't look them in the, don't look that gift horse in the mouth sort of thing. You know, go ahead and, uh, like you said, grab, uh, grab your master's, grab your PhD, whatever. What would you have got your master's in? A fine art, which is what I have my bachelor's in. Really? Yeah. So I paid my way through art school. Well, the last half of it, um, the first half of it, my parents helped me with and I mostly wasted that by being a skateboarder and playing video games <laughs> in the early night. Um, but the uh, the last half I got a full-time job um, and building as a with a uh, like an MSP and an integrator my roommate got me the job we'd we'd built some networks so we could play uh, Doom and Duke Nukem and I was like I can do this right this isn't that hard and he's like we haven't opening for like a team lead for an install team and i was like okay and i was a couple years older than they'd usually hire like 18 19 year old uh freshman college freshman to be on the install teams and i was already you know 21 or whatever and i or 20 how old i was early 20s and i, I can do that right i'd been the assistant manager of a video store so i had had the taste of authority <laughs> <laughs> and so i was like i'll just do this and and so i was you know, installing networks in K-12s and small service providers all over uh, Illinois and Indiana and stuff and doing that full time while I was going to college part time to pay for my art degree. And then when I, you know, I started the master's program and I was getting ready to get married. My wife was going into veterinary school and she's like, are you going to like graduate and get a job and stuff? I'm like, well, I got a job. And she's like, what about 
you know, get a, get an art job. So I started looking around and I was like, I would take a 50% pay cut to go and, you know, do an art job, even graphic design, which was like the highest paying art job. I'm like, I'm just going to keep doing this and I can do photography and film and stuff on my, on my own time <laughs> and actually eat. <laughs> so that's cool. Yeah. It would have cool. been an MFA. That's a, I think that's a big lesson to people, right? It's like you can still have a normal job and still fulfill that kind of creative side, that passionate side, you know, elsewhere. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be your, your full-time gig. I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I have some of a CS minor and, um, but I was more interested in the film minor that I was doing. So I finished that one first and CS was like, it was all COBOL and all this like nonsense enterprise stuff I didn't want to deal with. And so I was like, I'm not going to do that anymore. Yeah. I but, took, uh, I think I took like four classes of COBOL and I hated every second of it. And then, uh, I took one visual basic class. I was like, this is it. This is where I need to be. <laughs> I need to be making applications. Yeah. It's ridiculous. But I took, you know, like, um, a Java class and it was all like interactive, like making balls move. And I was like, this is stupid. I want to work with databases. And I saw so it, it was weird. Cause it's like, I felt like I'm really doing something if I'm doing this other stuff. That was, yeah. that was more well, my speed. I, I was pounding on routers and, and, and stuff like that while I was doing those classes. And I was like, you know, I can, I can turn off this DS three and all these people go dark <laughs> what am I doing over here with this COBOL? Like I'm editing bank <laughs> software. It's like, I don't, this is boring. Uh, I don't want to do this. I mean, there's nothing against it. It's just, it's not for me. Like yeah. I get distracted by squirrels. Yeah. So it wasn't, it wasn't busy enough for yeah, me. I'm glad I didn't actually get a job in computer science right out of school. Cause I think I would have gone crazy programming all day, every day. I think I would have yeah. every now and then I still do it and I still maintain some applications, but it's a nice sort of, squirrel away you know I'll, I'll go over here for a day and i'll and i'll write something or i'll do you know it's kind of a nice change of pace if i had to do it all the time yeah. i'd go bananas man well the other thing for me and where i did my undergrad the um you know the town is basically built around state farm insurance it's the national head or it's the global headquarters or whatever for state farm insurance and so a lot of what the curriculum at the time was churning out was people that could ready state farm for y2k which <laughs> COBOL, right? And I, at the time, had been installing service providers and building, you know, networks in K-12s and stuff. I was an outside kitty, you know. You don't take an outside kitty and then put them in business casual and sit them at a cubicle. It's, <laughs> they're going to they're gonna pee on the walls, right? It's, just, it's not going to work. So, and I did. I went to State Farm and their, and their fledgling security team for six months, and I... I had more migraines in that six months than I have had in probably a 18 month span prior or since I just, I couldn't deal with it. It was, it was too structured for me and it was, it just, it wasn't for me. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, enterprise networking is, there's a lot of money in it and that's the majority of what people do, but it was not for me. And so I was like, I'm going back to ISP stuff. Hmm. I get it. deal with it. So that's too weak. The day, the day you quit, do you remember that, uh, that feeling? Was it just like a sense of relief to finally get out of there? Oh my God, dude, getting escorted out of that building was one of the greatest feelings I've ever had. <laughs> I mean, cause I was on the security team. So I, uh, I was smart. I said, well, I want to put in like three weeks notice or whatever. And they're like, well, we have to escort you out of the building right now. Yeah. But I got, I kept getting paid. Because I put in the notice. Ah, very <laughs> clever. <laughs> that was all right. Yeah, that was okay. That's all right. Yeah, I, I've, I've left one job kind of in that state where I was just miserable. And I still remember just the instant I knew I was leaving, just that sense of relief. Just, oh, finally. Yep. All right. So next on the list you have gray is the new black, gray is the new white. I'm not sure where we're going with this one. Okay. So... One of the things that is really apparent to me in in working in technology for a long time is that highly technical people like boxes and they like things to fit neatly inside of those boxes. And they like those boxes to have very clear clear labels as to what's in the boxes. And that's never how the real world is. There's no black, there's no white. Everything's gray. There's always an edge case, there's always a snowflake, and there's always some random one-off right and that's totally okay 
it's expected. If you have a network that doesn't have any of those things, I would assert that it's probably not useful for at least somebody, <laughs> right? If not a handful of people. And I've had to build networks that are like that, right? You know, that are air gapped, that are secure networks for a very specific purpose. And they did exactly what they were supposed to do and nothing else. And that's not how most environments are built. So I think that um, embracing the gray area is uh, very important for two two things. One, having a successful and useful product for your customers or your constituents, whichever you have. And two, maintaining your own sanity, right? As soon as you can accept the fact that everything's not black and white, that you're going to have some edge case stuff and some gray area, you're going to be a lot happier. I mean, you may not be happy that you have to deal with it, but at least for me, your mind, my mind is like, okay, now I expect this, right? It's not a, it's not a sucker punch out of left field that now I have to do this other thing that's not quite exactly in the box that I want it to fit in. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, that's pretty universally uh, across the board of all technology, right? Te- technical people like, you know, it's ones and zeros, right? Except it's not. Sometimes there's a two. Yeah, it seems oh. like, you know, I've, I know some folks that are in very siloed environments where, like, I do this narrow slice of things. While I'm in IT, I'm just responsible for this one firewall, you know, or this one sets of servers. And it seems like those guys can get very rigid in their thinking, you know, like, it, it must be this way, absolutely. And those are the guys where somebody comes to them and they say, you know, we need something to do that can do this and this. And then they instantly pop off and they're like, that's the dumbest effing thing I've ever heard. You know, I've yep. actually heard people from different divisions talk to each other like that, you know? Um, for one, that's not helping, you know, uh, build a cohesive team environment. You know, it's like, you don't want to build, you know I mean? You don't want to start knocking people down instantly, but um, just the fact that there isn't any flexibility in their thinking, you know? And um, to me, that's, I think that's a sign of uh, old age. You know, as soon as you stop being flexible, you know, that means you've started regret, you know, you've started dying. I feel like, you know, well, you know, you know what happens to things that don't bend, right? They break, they break, they snap, right? And, and I think, you know, what I've always tried to teach when I'm, when I'm mentoring is, you know, don't, don't find a way to say no, figure out a way to get the, to, to fulfill the request in a way that works for everyone. Like saying no is easy and it's boring, yeah, yeah, absolutely. right? You never challenge yourself by just saying no to everything. Right. And I've been, a, I've been a security guy for a long time too, off and on. And um, that's pretty common, especially in enterprise security. Is like our job is to basically keep the stupid users, you know, in their pins. And I've, I've literally heard it described that way to me before. <laughs> and that was a huge red flag and I uh, was gone. <laughs> but, you know, the... There is a time to say no. Obviously, you can't always say yes to everything or else you're inundated and it's mayhem. Mm-hmm. But, you know, initially just saying no is probably also the wrong way to do it. Like, let's let's take it apart and figure out if it if there is a way to do it that fits, that meets all the requirements for all the teams. And then be communicative between each other. No. Right? Be helpful. Don't just be standoffish. Well, I think, too, there's really easy ways of saying no. I think a hard lesson I learned before was that part of being the expert thing, if you know the answer, even if it's a simple answer and you know it, don't always immediately say no and then give the what it should be. Um, What I found to do is say, okay, let me think about it, right? And so just the act of you saying, let me think about it and you come back a few hours later to them says, you know what? I've taken your... Your, your thoughts, your ideas, they have value and I've, I've mulled them over and it looks like this other approach, right? So one, you, by immediately saying no to people, you're saying what you're saying isn't valid, you know, and, yep. and even the tone you say it in can say, I think you're stupid, which is never, uh, even if it is <laughs> what you're thinking, it should never be what comes out of your mouth, right? One, but, but two, I think there's also easy ways of saying no. So I almost never say no, to be honest with you, uh, cause I think mm-hmm. everything is possible. Um, you just present evidence like it would cost us $50,000 to do that. Right. And if there's a budget of $500 for this project, well then that's a no, I don't have to say no. I'm just saying, here's the options at hand, you know, and, or maybe time-wise it's not feasible. That's another way of saying no, where you don't actually have to say, this is a dumb idea. You can just let, you know, evidence speak for itself. 
sort of thing. Yep, I, I like to do a couple of different things, and I really like the idea of stepping away and saying, let me think this over, or let me mull it over, or whatever. I think that's there's huge value there. If in no other uh, area than just validating someone else's um, idea, right? I'm going to think about this, right? And that's very important, I think, because you always want to build capital. You never want to burn capital. Yeah. And when you tell somebody no right out of the gate, you make them feel stupid, you're burning capital. But when you make them feel valuable, you're building capital with them. Um, but I like to do, when I like to, <laughs> when I have to say no, and, and I will fully admit I am very poor at saying no because I'm the same way. Like, I like challenges and I like to do things. Um, but if I have to say no, I'll do one of two things. I'll say, this isn't, we can't do this the way, you know, we can't give you exactly what you have asked for because here's the reasons, right? And they're valid reasons. But how about if we do this instead, hmm. right? This, will this meet your needs? And if I can't give them that option, then I'll say, you know, basically here's the reasons why we can't make this work right now, but let's add this to the smoldering projects file so that we don't forget about it, right? And so the next time something comes around, like a refresh or whatever, then we can say, okay, well, here's some needs and requirements that we weren't able to meet for somebody last time. Can we add those in, and what does that change for the next X amount of thing we're doing? Um, and people tend to like that, especially when you follow back up, and, and very much especially after a long period of time when they've probably given up. If you come back and say, hey, I didn't forget you, and can we do this now? I mean, people love that. Yeah, I love I love the idea of of coming to them with an alternate solution. That's what I tell my guys. I say, don't come to me with problems. Come to me with solutions. So if you see a problem, try and think of your own solution first. Present that to me, right? I mean, it it may not be yep. the one we ultimately go with, but it, what if it is? And then yeah. you can own this. This was all you, you know. And so it just it gets people thinking, kind of. It gets them in that mindset of how can I fix this problem and not just. Like you said, dump it on the guy that never says no. Right. It also builds it builds their confidence too. When you say, "Don't come to me with a problem. Come to me with a solution," you're telling them I value what you have to say, and you know it gets them into the critical thinking mode. We're like, "Hey, now I can solve this problem." And if I bring this, one of two things is going to happen, or one of three things. You know, it's either going to be the thing what we do. I'm going to learn why it's not complete or won't work. So I'm going to learn something from it. Or, you know, I spent some time in critical thinking and it just didn't work out. Right. I mean, the last one is sort of subset of the second yeah. one, but I think, you know, they're all valuable. Yeah. And I think it's great to get new perspectives too. There's been, I get tunnel vision so bad. So if I'm, if I'm hammering nails all day long and I have a hammer in my hand and you walk up to me and say, how do I put this piece of paper on the wall? I bet the first thing that jumps out is I could just hammer that SOB to the wall when this other person will probably say, let's just put a piece of tape on it because it only needs to be there for 10 minutes. You know, let's not, <laughs> you know what I mean? So sometimes I just get so tunnel vision on things that the obvious solution doesn't always jump out at me yep. embarrassingly. So especially when like a non-technical person points out an obvious solution, I'm like, oh my God, yeah, we could do it that way. You know, yep. it's just sometimes, you know, the best of us, get that tunnel vision. Yeah, so it, it's, it's good to, it's good to have some outside perspective. I love being able to bounce. Even if somebody takes a completely different approach, that's not going the direction you would have. Sometimes there's, I mean, you, I've seen amazing things come out of those scenarios. Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, personally, I tend to, I tend to be more of the, um, strategy and architecture type of mind. Like I don't think about a lot of the details. So, Whenever I'm trying to come up with an idea, I have people that I trust that I've known for a long time that they understand the details, and I'll go to them and I'll say, here's this thing, you know, and they'll say, what about this, and how does that work? And, and it'll point out things that I've very clearly missed. Um, and so getting that outside perspective is, is big. And the hammer comment reminded me, somebody once said, when you've got a hammer, everything looks like a network. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know why that, I don't know why that works but it totally uh, does that's hilarious yeah I mean and I almost say once you've played with Microtik for a while everything looks like you should stick a Microtik in there even though that's not probably you know the core of your 
you know, a hundred percent SLA network is probably not the place for that micro tick, but yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I, I really like that gear. I do too. I mean, it, I use the hell out it of it. Does, I do too. But also I know if I've got like a fortune 500 company and they're asking me how my networks run, if I say micro tick, uh, they might make a face, but if I say, you know, if I say Juniper or I say Cisco or it's something they recognize, they'll be just, okay. And then they'll move yep. on to something else. Right. Sometimes you're just yep. looking for ways to, uh, not eliminate yourself from the equation. So, <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to yeah. say the wrong thing right now. Uh, so that's usually kind of an easier one. Yeah. All right. So you say networking is largely social technical as an artifact. What is that? We've kind of, we've kind of skirted around this already, right? So I've always been under the uh, very firm opinion that networking especially, um, and IT to a certain extent as well, is much more social than people want it to be. Like it's about interactions. It's about getting the needs and requirements from somebody and then giving them something that provides them a service that they need. The technical bits and pieces are largely irrelevant and fairly easy to teach right? When I'm, when I'm hiring someone, I got a couple of examples. When I, when I, when I want to hire somebody, I don't necessarily care what their experience level is, depending on what level I'm hiring for. What I care about is, do they have a good attitude? Mm. Like, are they self-starters? Are they hungry? Right? Do they, are they willing to learn? Are they personable? And will they fit in with the culture? Yes, cool. Right? Are they, are, and then, do they have the aptitude to learn what I have to teach oh, them? Yeah. Right. So attitude and aptitude. And I've probably said that a million times, but I'm going to say it again. Cause I think it's super important. Like you can teach anybody that has the right aptitude or has the right aptitude. But if you hire a brilliant asshole, you're probably <laughs> stuck with them for a while. Yeah. They might be, they might be great at their job, but if they're toxic, that's going to spread like mold inside, rot your organization out from the inside. Oh, yeah. So getting, getting the right attitude and the right aptitude is a huge part of it. And the other thing, um, networking being largely social, especially the Internet, you know, anybody that's ever done external BGP peerings at scale realizes that probably at least in the old days it was like two-thirds or three-fourths of your peerings were probably um, coordinated over beers at like a nanog. Right. I mean, it's it's a hey, I'm at this location. Hey, I'm at this location. Cool. Come, let's set up a you know, let's get a cross connect or whatever. Right. And now I have a bilateral peering or settlement free peering with this other network. That's super common. And it's still it's still pretty common to have your, you know, your external peering arrangements coordinated like over the phone. Right. I mean, BGP is essentially routing by rumor. <laughs> You know, it's you tell me what you have. And in the old days, there were no filters, you know, and we've all experienced the uh, hijacking. Yeah. And I used to always say, until you've leaked the global table to appear, you haven't earned your network <laughs> senior network engineer card. Right. We've all done uh... it. I mean, I, I did it. Here's the gra <laughs> the job I have now. I was interviewing for this job i had to fly out and interview for this job on uh like a tuesday i was flying out on monday and, and uh interviewing on tuesday on sunday i was cutting over the regional service provider from foundry to juniper and i had written all the templates and i had done all the work and the gear was running in place it was basically moving things right well we peered with the place i work now and I had typoed the prefix list and the policy statement, and I leaked the global table to the place I had to interview at on <laughs> in in two days. Uh, so, you know, luckily they were smart and they had filters and it shut down the peering automatically. So, I mean, problem solved. But again, I had to call somebody and say, "Hey, I tripped your I tripped your peering uh, filter." And can you please reset it? I fixed the problem, right? So it's largely social. I can't, there's no, there's no automated way to deal with things like that. So there's a lot of personal interaction and I think that's often discounted, right? Going to a Nanog and, and hanging out afterwards, you know, over dinner or whatever 
is immensely useful for learning and for building relationships that will then potentially flower into some kind of other productive networking thing. Yeah, um, that's, I think that's, I love the idea of that, but for me, I am such an introvert. Like it is so like I went, I've been to one nanog and I didn't know anybody there. And I was forcing myself, anybody that I got within distance where I could touch them, I was making myself talk to them. And that is so hard for me to do. And I don't know, man, I didn't, I didn't, I don't, I, I walked away. I met one guy, that super cool guy. Um, uh, Kopchinski is his last name, Tom Kopchinski. He's the guy who organizes the shine oh. stuff. Yeah. yeah. Super nice guy. So smart, Very so guy. smart guy. And, uh, so I was lucky enough to, I think, sit next to him at breakfast one day, you know, and he was one of those few suckers that I actually talked to. But I don't know, man, it just sort of felt like because everybody there knew everybody and, you know, they were all like just kind of in their groups and just ah, it, it feels like it's definitely hard to break into that sort of uh, thing. You know, I don't have that problem because I'm an extrovert. So I'm just like, hey, what's going on? You know, let's <laughs> hug. But like I can see that being hard, you know, and, and that's that's just a thing that. You, 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 you met one person and you got a contact yeah. and I think that I would consider that a win. And he's a cool guy. That's right up the road for me. Huh. So I try to go, I try to go to that. Except last time I went, I had to see Hammett, you know, <laughs> he was there kicking around, <laughs> causing trouble. I know. You try and look the other way and then he sees you and <laughs> oh God, we got to talk and interact. No, I mean, I, 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 it's the same thing with the, the, the moms. The first time I went, I didn't know anybody there. And I think I maybe met one person or two. I uh, I met the Giannis Megas the first time I went to the mom. That was in Dallas a million years ago, and I asked him something, and he was he was very Latvian about it, you know, which is just very curt and to the point. And I was like, oh shit, all right. And then uh, I got out of there, and uh, I don't I don't know <laughs> that I necessarily walked away with like a lot of context, but I kept coming back and. You start seeing the same faces and then you pick up one or two and then that, you know, and then those two bring two more. And so you just ended yep. up, I mean, that's how we ended up with this brother's whist crap is just, uh, just meeting one person after another and then trying to hang on to them. And, um, just this collection of wealth of, of, of knowledge, but man, yeah, you definitely have the gift of gab. I can see how that super works for you. It does. I mean, I mean, I just kept bugging you guys. Like, let's do a show on. <laughs> DNS or let's do this or yeah, let's do that. It. I'll come on and talk. I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But also I think like a lot of people that are veterans in the industry and uh I mean I think I think veteran now is is like if you've got eight years, ten years, you know, in the industry where you're really networking, you're you're probably close to a veteran at this point, you know, and you've got a lot to give back. And so I think it's, yeah. I mean, I think it's so kick-ass that you are so excited to get in front of people and just talk to them about uh, your experiences, things you've done, things you've done wrong, right? A lot of people don't want to talk about their failures, but... Uh, oh, God, but, we'd be here all day <laughs> if I was talking about that, probably no, tomorrow, too. Right, it's like, uh, if I don't want to just hear about uh, your success, your successful journey. I want to hear about all the things you did wrong so that I can avoid those pitfalls, too, right? Or... or you know, it's so funny is um, some of the advice people have given me, it's because they've heard of other people having problems, right? And so you sharing that knowledge yep. may not help that person directly, but I mean, shoot, they may be able to pass it on down the road. So it goes a long way. Yep. I'm all about that. I mean, I like to help and I like to grow. I mean, I like doing this stuff. So, you know, the more I can provide input within the, you know, the constraints of the hours I'm awake and able to do it, you know, I'm, I'm happy to try to do it. But coming back around to what you originally said, you said, basically, I'm going to distill it down. You hire for personality um, and aptitude, and then everything else we can teach you, right? And yep. I so believe in that. So one of the criteria I do is uh, I take a new potential hire, and I let them like go to lunch with all our guys. And so at the end of it, I'll say, all right, so of our X number of candidates, which ones you like the best? And that holds a lot of weight, right? Because if, yeah, if they are the wrong person, they're going to bring down that whole room. You know what I mean? They're yep. going to negatively impact. Um, and and luckily, like my most recent guy I've gotten, phenomenal. Like he uh, did computer stuff on his own. He had just gotten a CCNA. And you know what I really liked about him too was that he was like a math whiz in high school. 
And so he had that brain where everything's a puzzle and he wants to figure it out. And I feel like that's what a lot of networking is, right? It's, it's a puzzle that Definitely. you get to figure out. And so he gets to do that all the time now. Um, that's awesome, man. It's, it's so great when you can hire good people that fit culturally. Uh, it's like, you feel so relieved. You just feel lucky sometimes. Yep. I mean, I, I know there's, there's services you can sign up for and do all that stuff that supposedly help profile people. And like, I've done the disc profile stuff before, but I, I still don't think there is any real solution, any foolproof solution for any of that stuff. You got to throw them in the group and see how they interact, man. That's the only way to do it. I mean, by the time they make it to the in-person interview, you've probably already skimmed their resume. So you're, you know what to expect. The phone interview, you suss out whether that resume is accurate or yeah. they've embellished it. And then by the time you bring them in, you're really just testing for personality at that point. You know what? Uh, I was talking to a guy two weeks ago, and he owns an MSP. It's not a, it's not a real big one, but he was saying that he started a new strategy, I guess, in the last year. And he said it's worked really well for him is that whenever he hires a guy, after about three months, if he doesn't seem like he's working out, he'll go up to that guy and he'll say, look, man, I like you a lot. I, you know, I think you do some pretty good work, but this doesn't really seem like this is your passion. Like this is what you really want to be doing. So I tell you what, I'll give you three months salary and you can just walk away right now. And, you know, you know, we'll stay friends, you know, and, you know, if I can help you in the future, you let me know. And, uh, you know, if not, you know, let's see what we can do about kind of, you know, getting you a little bit more engaged. And I said, well, how many, <laughs> I, what, how did I ask it? I was something like, um, how many people, you know, or no, what I said was, so what did you do to kind of re-engage those guys? He goes, I don't know. Every single one of them is taking the three month salary and left. So, <laughs> so it actually yeah. solved the problem. He's like, cause I didn't want to fire these guys. You know, it's like, I didn't want to have to do that. Um, so yeah. I just, you know, figure out where they're really at and that three month salary makes a decision for them. So yeah. I thought that was kind it of an interesting easy. play. Yeah. That is very interesting, especially if you can afford that. Yeah. I think that's a way to save face in both directions. Yeah, right. because it'll help that guy bridge the gap to find a new job, and it kind of, yeah. you know, it gets the burden off of your plate. You don't have to do it anymore. Yeah, yeah. firing people sucks. Yeah, yeah. I haven't done it in a long yeah. time, but I, you know, it's not a great yeah. day. Yeah, I don't, I don't look at it as that anymore. We do uh, PIPs, um, performance improvement plans, so if mm. they don't, meet up to the pip, then they fire themselves. Right. So it's, yeah. it's kind of the only, I, I have problems firing people big time. So I'm very empathetic and I try and work with people as much as possible and remember they're humans, right? That's something I've yeah. been at companies where you are quite literally a barcode in, in their system. Like I, I nice. worked at a place where if I wanted to go to the bathroom, I had to punch my code into the bathroom and then punch it back. And then they would run reports on how much time you spent in the bathroom and, uh, how much, to, you know, so it's like you were quite literally a number there. And so I, I try and remember, um, the people are humans, you know, it's, it's, it, it's funny nice. that you said that because, you know, and I mentioned working at uh, state farm, one of the things that was the, the straw that broke the camel's back was, um, someone complained to my boss that I was going to the bathroom too often. <laughs> and it was because at the time I was young and I was bodybuilding. So I was eating like insane amounts of protein, which meant I had to – basically I would come into work every day with a, a gallon jug of water because you have to flush – sort of it's hard on your kidneys. So I'd eat all this protein throughout the day, and I'd drink this gallon of water, and I'd have to go to the bathroom all the time. And so one of the people literally tattled on me, and I was like, I, I'm done. Yeah. I'm done here. Well, this company also, <laughs> they had a, a cafeteria there, so they would subsidize – so. That, the cafeteria company that came in and, you know, and like did the catering or whatever was guaranteed X amount of money. So if the employees didn't spend enough, then the company had to subsidize. So they would actually run reports on who went to the lunchroom and bought lunch. And if you like your department wasn't eating enough in the lunchroom, the manager would like get in trouble. So it was like, it was crazy, dude. It was so crazy. It was, it's not a great place oh, to work for, but yeah. they, you learned from yeah, it. I sh I'm sure I, I, I got everything I could out of that company. They gave me uh, time on the clock to get my certification. So I don't regret any of it, but uh, you know, it's just, nobody wants to be in an environment like that. And so, yeah, it definitely, um, uh, it made me realize the kind of company I wanted to work for and how I wanted to treat my people. 
at that point yeah. I didn't have people, but I knew once I did, I, I knew how I wanted to be different for sure. Yeah. So let's pop to the last one. You say play to your strengths or play to strengths. Play your strengths. So this is a big one for me because um, being, you know, having done this for a long time, I've had to do a lot of things. And th- you're always going to have to do some of this, right? I've had to do a lot of things that ne- weren't necessarily my core competency. Like I'm not a extremely detail-focused person. So like asking me to do this very meticulous process that, you know, is very detail-oriented and whatever, that's I'm, I'm going to get it done but I'm probably going to be hating life Mm -hmm. and it's probably going to take me longer than everyone else to it, to do it. So, you know, find the person that is good at those things and wants to do them and then play to those strengths. Right. And again, you're not always going to be able to do this. You're always going to have to eat your vegetables before you eat your dessert. Right. But like having the ability to say, I know you're good at this particular thing and I think you like doing it. So let's make this part of your, job description, right? And giving the people the ability to do those kind of things will make for happier employees. It'll make, you know, which in turn will make you happier if you're, you know, their manager or or their peer or whatever. Um, And so that's just a big one for me is, you know, if you, if you have somebody that you know is good at something, or if you yourself are good at something and you want to do it, make sure people know that like, Hey, I think I'm good at this. I think I can do a good job at it and I want to do it can I start doing it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that manager's not inside your head. You know, he doesn't see what you see. So if you feel a certain way or you think a certain way, you've got to let him know. Yeah, no one's ever going to hand you all the things you want. You have to ask. And that's really what play to your strengths means. Like, if you want something, ask for it. If you you think you're good at something and you want to do it, ask. If they're not handing it to you, ask for it. Oh, yeah. The worst thing that'll happen is they'll tell you no. No employer's ever going to say, uh, no, you can't have more work to do. <laughs> you know, yeah, right. Like, no, for sure. I want to keep doing all this bullshit. Don't take any of it from me. Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what they want yep. to hear. They want to see, they want to see you being engaged in the company. They want to see growth. They want to see you taking on new challenges. Yep. And and me as a manager, I love to see my people grow. You know, that's what I tell them. I was like, whenever you leave this place, you know, I want you to be such a badass. I want you to be so amazing when you leave here that you're going to blow people away and they're going to be like, man, you must have had an awesome manager. <laughs> Just for some yeah, reason, I mean, it's like, man, I want to look good by making you look good. Absolutely. I mean, so let people play to their strengths, play to your own strengths, and you'll go a lot further and you'll be a lot happier. Yeah. So- and, and you know, a lot of people in IT are just like, oh, you know, this is I'm overloaded with work or oh, whatever yeah. and it stinks. And, and that's just part of it, right? But like, if you can have 20% of your time or 15% of your time to work on something you're like super passionate about, it's kind of your baby or whatever, I think you'd be shocked at how far that goes. Mm. Um, if you could do it 100% of the time, man, you dress lucky charms, right? Yeah. Magically delicious. There's this really interesting right. cat that I work with sometimes, and uh, he gave me a good piece of advice. He gives a lot of advice. Most of it's pretty Looney Tunes, but this one was really good. He said... Um, do what you're good at and for everything else, find somebody to do it for a good price. And so I think that's, that's good. Even inside of a company, you know, if, if you're really good at these that's, things, that's really good. Do them. Actually. If you're not find somebody else in there who actually is really good at those things and, you know, delegate it. You know, if, if they can do it 80% good as you can at this point, delegate it, you know, don't oh, yeah. make yourself crazy. And that life work balance thing, you know, IT is very cyclical. You know, we all get miserable mm-hmm. at some point. Hopefully, uh, the good outweighs the bad. And I've I've been there where the bad was bad for a really long time. And man, you know, you take that stuff home with you and it affects you. But hopefully, you can yep. find a way to get yourself. But you know what? A lot of that was I wasn't I wasn't articulating to my management how miserable I was. You know, I was just suffering yeah. in silence. So. You know, I, I should have went to that because to me, it was a sign of weakness showing that I couldn't handle my job. Right. That's why. But I, I wish I had gone to them and said, hey, I need help. I need this. I need that. You know, I, they would understand. Right. Yeah. And life's too short for that, man. No one should suffer in silence. Yeah. Yeah. Suffer out loud so everybody else can be miserable, too. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but no, no, it's just, yeah, it's don't be so afraid to ask for help, you know, because if. Uh, I had those kidney stones last week 
And the instant I walked in the Ooh. door, I was like, I need some drugs. Drugs right here. This guy. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I was like, definitely give me the yes, whatever. All they would give me was some bullshit stuff at first, like some extra strength Motrin or whatever. And then as soon as they <laughs> got the, uh, the the CAT scan done, they're like, yeah, yeah, uh, you've got kidney stones. Here's some good stuff. It's like, oh, thank God. Um, I had the same experience with the appendix. I had acute appendicitis, and they were like, that's got to come out right now. Yeah. But until they know what's wrong with you, they're like, this guy might just be fishing for meds, so yep. here's a Tylenol. <laughs> yep. It's like a, Here's a sugar yeah. pill. Now go. I had some Tic Tacs on the way. No, thanks. You keep the Tylenol. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that's awesome, man. Well, shoot, dude. If uh, people wanted to get a hold of you out on the internet, how would they go about that? Oh, I've got a Twitter. It's forwarding plane. And then I have a blog that I've actually been updating a yeah, little bit. Uh, forwarding plane on that. I've been, I've been, so I have this, like, I have like 15 years worth of like config snippets and stuff in Evernote. And I was like, man, I'm always digging through Evernote. If I'm digging around for the stuff that I wrote myself, <laughs> I bet you other people probably find this useful. So I've been slowly like just shoving it into the configuration archive section of uh of my of my blog and i think it's useful and a lot of it's derivative of other things i found or whatever but like there's some stuff in there that's just like man i couldn't find this anywhere and so i'm just gonna write it up and figure it out and then put it out there yeah yeah well you say it's derivative but like um i have some blog posts where i link to other people's stuff and I'll go back mm -hmm. and I'll try and hit those links and they're dead now. So yep. even if you feel like it's maybe duplication, that you know, sometimes that stuff doesn't last forever. So it's good that you're putting it up anyway. Yeah, I'm just getting it out there because it's like I said, it's just sitting in my Evernote and I think there's some there's some microtick stuff. I mean, I, I'm like I haven't even scratched the surface. I think there's maybe ten things I've added in the last week or so. Not even scratched the surface. So there's some microtick stuff, there's some edge OS stuff, there's some iOS XR. There's not any Juniper stuff in there yet, but I have a huge amount of that. So it's all just get shoved in there so that maybe somebody will find it useful someday. That's baller, man. Well, I you try. said fordingplane.net? Mm -hmm. All right, man. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on, Nick. Hey, man, anytime. I love this stuff. I do too. I'm all charged up now. <laughs> yeah, I'm juiced, <laughs> baby. Uh, I'm juiced. Yeah. <laughs> But if any of you guys listening have any questions, be sure to pop over and hit up Nick. If you end up in uh, the Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Brothers List, you end up there in the Little Brothers List Slack. Nick is very active in there. Um, he's always been, um, you've always been really quick to respond whenever I at you on stuff, which I think is pretty killer. Um, if you have any tips that you want to give us, you want to sit here and record this thing with us, uh, drop those to me. They keep trickling in. Thank you again, Nick, for doing yours. Uh, I'm still trying to get Dominic on the schedule. He sent me his tips, but I need him to get in here and, and, and talk mm. to me on them. And uh, you know what? There's probably some people that aren't this comfortable talking, but would still like to send them in. So in that case, even if you're not comfortable getting on camera, go ahead and send them in. And, uh, Thank you guys for listening yeah, and think one more time. Thank you so much. So sit right. back and Bye, start guys. learning. Lighting up the tower so people can start searching. Shooting up the web and neighborhoods net surfing. We got horrible jokes. We're loud and annoying. But we're informative facts. We're not disappointing. Just give us a listen. Because fun is the mission. I'm telling you, you don't know what you are missing. Ideas and some good comedy given. If you missed the show already, don't worry. You're forgiven.